Um, my name's Maria Lee. I teach environmental law. I teach tort law. I'm sure I'll be meeting quite a lot of you over the next year. And I hope you have a really great time, whatever you're studying. Now, I've got 20 minutes on climate change, world on fire, as you see. Um, and my main message, I think, given that only about 25 of you will be studying climate change, my main message is that climate change is too important to be left to the environmental lawyers. Climate change is a whole economy, whole society problem. So it needs all of you to get involved in legal solutions, not just environmental lawyers, although obviously environmental lawyers are crucial. I was trying to think of a quick 20 minute introduction to the horror that is climate change. And the contents page of this book is pretty cool at setting out the horror. You may not be able to see it properly. It's quite vague actually, as I look at it on this screen. Um, but basically, we're going to have heat death, we're going to have hunger, drowning, wildfire, we're going to have no fresh water, we're going to have dead oceans, we're going to have air that can't be breathed, we're going to have new plagues and diseases. All of that is true, none of it is an overstatement. The challenges we face are really quite extraordinary. However, I reckon you've probably heard that a lot. And you're probably even a bit tired of hearing about it, and it no longer has much of an impact. This lovely book, almost unreadable, it's so tough, but this lovely book starts by observing, and I'm quoting, global war warming is worse, much worse than you think. Even those of you who think you know, it's worse than you think. What he says is, the global warming, climate change, it's not like now, but hotter. It's this. It's hunger and death and drowning and drought and all of those things. And it's not in the future and it's not somewhere else. It's already here and it's now. And one of the things he says which really struck me is that the heat of the last few summers, where basically those, who are, those of us who are rich and fit would mainly be fine, but the poor and the old and the sick have not been fine. And there have been wildfires everywhere, including in the UK, which is quite extraordinary. He says the last few summers, they won't be the new normal. But by the time you're our age, they'll be the good old days because things are going to keep changing. So I recommend that book, actually. Um, much as it is an actual horror show to read. It's very powerful and it's beautifully written and it's true. Now, environmental lawyers tend to be people who are skilled in how to govern and how to regulate. That's kind of what we do. We care about the environment, we understand environmental challenges, and what we do is learn about governance, learn about regulation, learn about the way that laws might be used to protect the environment. That's obviously going to be important for climate change, but it's just not the only thing we need. We need critical corporate lawyers, we need trade lawyers, we need finance lawyers, we need pension lawyers, we need public lawyers. And I've put these two reports up because they're not environmental reports. So the one on the left is the UN Human Rights Council Human Rights. The one the financial system, and it's a report on how climate change will affect the financial system. The network for greening the financial system was set up by eight central banks, and it now has 34 members. 34 central bank members. There are loads of stuff I could have picked from the sort of financial world for the financial lawyers amongst you. Um, this is just one of many reports that have come out of the financial world. Okay, so these aren't environmental lawyers. These are other people. The human rights report is angry. It's a really angry, strong report. It's very powerfully written. In style, it's completely different from the financial report. It's very powerfully written. If you look at this slide here, 
The human rights community has been every bit as complacent as most governments in the face of the ultimate challenge to mankind rep represented by climate change. So the human rights lawyers in the world, you need to start thinking about climate change along with all of those other problems that you face at the moment. These are also quotes from um, that report, so from the human rights report. So we generally focus on rights to life, water and sanitation, health, food and housing. Those rights are desperately affected by climate change already and in the future. Okay? So that's where we've been concentrating. But this report, and they're obviously correct, focus equally on democracy and the rule of law, on civil and political rights. There's going to be a very fraught process that will require great vigilance on the parts of governments, human rights institutions, national and regional courts. The challenges of, first of all, reducing our carbon emissions to try to respond to climate change, and then the challenges of adapting to the catastrophes that will come our way, make human rights, rule of law, fragile. And yet, to respond to climate change, we really, really need institutions that protect us. We really, really need the institutions associated with the rule of law, democracy, human and civil rights. Yeah? So it's a very powerful report on that. And um, so paragraph 65 up there is about, about reducing our emissions. That's going to be tough for rule of law and um, civil and political rights. Paragraph 66 is about adapting to the new world. The risk of community discontent, of growing inequality, greater levels of deprivation, these will stimulate, likely stimulate, nationalist, xenophobic, racist and other responses. Like we don't have enough of that at the moment. Yeah? So this report is extremely powerful and it tells us that we need more than environmental lawyers dealing with this, that this is a whole society problem. So the NFGS report, the financial report, is very measured in its language. It's very calm. Everything is manageable. It's nothing to panic about, people. Just stay calm and the financial system will survive. But nevertheless, the stuff they're saying is quite extraordinary. So I'm not going to go through all this. But if you look at that slide, and I'll put the slides up on Moodle somewhere, but if you look at those slides, you've got physical impact, which have a massive financial effect. Transition impacts, meaning as we stop emitting carbon and we need to get to net zero, as we stop emitting carbon, there will be a big transition in our economy. And those changes will affect our entire financial system. So whatever in this room you are studying, this affects you. This is your problem and it's your responsibility to try to help to respond systematically and institutionally, not just in your personal life choices. So on the second, on the right hand side of that slide, this is, you know, from the summary of the report. But the thing I really want to point out to you is that bit where they say that um, there is a high degree of certainty that some combination of increasing physical and transition risks will materialise. We're very, very used to starting conversations about climate change with a big debate about uncertainty. This is the financial system. These are powerful actors in the global financial system. And they're saying, mm, it's not, it, we know it's going to happen. That's why we have to do something about it. Okay? So, um, there's been a lot of attention to climate change over the last few weeks. The bottom picture is UCL's um, extinction rebellion, Pond's extinction rebellion, and then the wonderful um, school strikes, of course. Um, this sort of attention, the sort of 
the sort of rejection of normal political processes around climate change, it isn't new. Every few years, there's a, a sort of new um, non-traditional NGO that, that pops up to make a to bring a lot of attention to climate change. So it's not new, but the scale has been extraordinary, both in terms of reach, the global reach, and in terms of numbers within particular societies. So the scale has been extraordinary. And I think there are two things going on with Extinction Rebellion in particular. So I think on the one hand, as you see on this slide, on the one hand, there's a recognition that traditional methods aren't working, that we've been using traditional methods for 30 years and climate, uh, carbon emissions are increasing, not going down, not staying the same, but going up. Okay, so there's a recognition that traditional methods have failed. Um, that's Fahana, sorry, yeah, that's Fahana um, Yamin, who's an international environmental lawyer, who's an extremely good friend of the faculty here. She's been and taught for us on various occasions, whether she'll um, be teaching at all this year, I'm not sure yet. Um, but she's a very good friend of the, of, of the faculty. She's a very well-respected international environmental lawyer, and she has taken important roles negotiating in the big climate change conferences over many years. She glued herself to the pavement outside Shell headquarters in kind of despair at, you know, where her whole life's work was going. And that's a lovely article that she wrote in Nature magazine, and there's a link there, and again, I'll put this up on the... Um, on, on a website somewhere. So, essentially, Extinction and Rebellion are saying traditional methods are not working. But then what do they say? Then they say, but we need some more law. So, traditional methods aren't working, but we need more traditional methods. Because, really, we don't have a lot else. We don't have a lot else to stabilise and drive change. Institutions are the things that provoke the change that we need. I think so. Some of you may disagree. But even Extinction Rebellion turns back to law when they're trying to make things actually happen. So the law on climate change. So it's all about targets. There's lots and lots of, of law on targets. And that really lovely article, The Wrong Trousers, um, I haven't got time to explain why they use the metaphor of the wrong trousers, but have a look, you'll find it quite amusing. So the relentless optimism of target setting. We set a two degree target and we're going to miss it. So we say, ha, let's go for 1.5 degrees. There's a relentless optimism, which I think is probably necessary. Because um, if you spend too much time listening to me, you get a bit pessimistic. And then what happens? You don't do anything. And um, so there is a relentless optimism of targets, and those targets are embedded at every level of law. So the UN international level, EU law, UK law, cities, regions, everything in between. The targets are important. I don't think they're just relentless optimism. I think they're also a tool of accountability, a tool by which we set stable policy expectations because they're not easy to change if they're in law so they're important but on their own they do absolutely nothing so what's more important about the targets are the institutions that we build around them and I think Pete may have said parliament is not prorogued that is not unconnected to climate change we need institutions of democracy and institutions for the rule of law, courts and parliaments, in order to respond to this challenge. Yeah? So as well as the targets in, for example, the Climate Change Act, you've got a process of review and checking and planning and moving forward. It's not working brilliantly at the moment, but you need those institutions to make this work. But that's the law on climate change. And if you have a look... Um, you'll see, so this is, they do an emissions gap report, the U United Nations Environment Programme, do an emissions gap report every year. And basically what they look at, not what we're actually doing, but what governments say they will do. And whether what governments say they will do will avoid catastrophe. 
And the emissions gap is that even if governments do everything that they say they will do, we will not meet our two degrees climate change target. And that's what this is about. And the quotation at the bottom is the one I want. So yes, we need to strengthen our targets. That's basically the NDC's nationally determined contributions. Yes, we need to um, strengthen our targets. But domestic policies are crucial to translate that ambition into action. It's not about climate change law. It's about everything else that we do. So then you get to not law about climate change, but law in the context of climate change. And actually, this is at least as important as climate change law. And this is why I say this is too important to be left to the environmental lawyers. Environmental lawyers are crucial. I've spent my whole life doing environmental law, so I'm not suggesting that we are not also necessary. But you need people who understand corporations you know, what does it mean that Shell, where Fahana glued herself to the pavement, that Shell head office, if you like, is corporate, has a separate corporate identity from Shell's operations all over the world? What does that mean for climate change? What does that mean for accountability and responsibility of corporations? How do we find out what corporations are doing? What are the rules on corporate disclosure? How do we make the rules on corporate disclosure stick? What are our pension funds doing about climate change? What are the rules on that? Should they care? Do we have any tools to hold them to account? What about tort? What about property? What about our rights? And then you've obviously got public law, administrative law. The rule of law, as that human rights report said, the rule of law is possibly threatened by the huge social and economic changes that climate change is likely to bring. But the rule of law is also absolutely necessary to respond to the challenge of climate change because we need everyone to do stuff, not just the weak. We need the powerful to be forced to take action and we need that to happen everywhere, straight away, all the time. And we need to know it's gonna last. So the rule of law is really important here. So. That's all I'm going to say on climate change. 20 minutes on climate change. See? Easy. That's all you need. Um, but, oh, no, this one. <laughs> Missed it. Sorry. This is, this is, this is David Wallace-Wells again. Is it too late? It's not too late because it's only going to get worse. So even if it were too late to hit two degrees, it's still important to keep taking action. But what I am going to do is leave you with some Centre for Law and the Environment events. The one at the bottom is Tom Burke, who is our um, visiting professor, who's basically going to talk about climate change and the rule of law. Okay? So everyone, not just environmental lawyers, are very welcome at all of these events. Um, Tom will be fascinating because he's a fascinating ma man. The others also, um, although not on climate change necessarily, um, all of those events are open to all of you. You're all most welcome. They will all have a little drink at the end, so there's a chance to meet people and all the rest of it. Um, so please do join us. You need to sign up, but you don't need to pay. Thank you. <laughs>